Okay, awesome. So uh, next session is by Bhavna. So Bhavna is head of marketing and growth at DevRef. She has two decades of experience in business and tech side of things. She has built her own company, uh, handled product, sales, strategy, and everything. So she'll talk more about herself. Uh, so the session today is more about PLG and sales. So over to you, Bhavna. Thank you, Jagal. Can you guys hear me over there? Awesome. Thanks for that uh, warm intro. Uh, so today we'll talk a lot about go to market. I also had a chance to talk to several of you around uh, the room. Uh, it seems like most folks are familiar with PLG. They're curious to learn about go to market. Uh, they're also curious to see if PLG is the right model. Uh, we'll touch upon a lot of those topics. Uh, we'll talk about go to market, but also how to set a strong foundation uh, from day one if you think about sustainable growth. So a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Bhavna Thuri. Been in Silicon Valley for 20 years, all of it in software and SaaS. I'm currently at DevRev. I was the first employee. Uh, I founded the product team and now heading marketing and growth at DevRev. Uh, I've also been in various uh, software SaaS companies in the past, also with growth stage companies. Uh, whether you call it like 1 to 10, 10 to 50, million at Apache before we had an exit there. And uh, also with Nutanix and Cisco, uh, where there's a lot about large scale businesses at 1 billion, 5 billion. And, and there the growth strategies are, even though it's single digit, you're thinking about what do I acquire? How do I extend my portfolio? Uh, so there goes my experience. I'm uh, originally from Hyderabad. Uh, I went to school in Pilani. And uh, after graduation, went to the US for higher studies. Uh, and never returned, but uh, my heart is still with India. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about uh, DevRev, uh, and if you, and I'll also explain what is DevRev, but I want to start with our, um, the founding of DevRev. Uh, our founders are uh, Dheeraj Pandey and Manoj Agarwal. Uh, we, uh, I don't know if you know Dheeraj Pandey from Nutanix. He was the CEO and co-founder of Nutanix. And uh, Nutanix was the largest tech IPO in 2016. So grew the company from zero to over a billion and a half. Uh, and a lot of the learnings from Nutanix uh, is what we applied to DevRev. So I was also at Nutanix and you know, we were able to get really high uh, net promoter score. Uh, you know, we had good growth, but it took a lot to get there because we had you know, really great team, but we had to stitch together a lot of different tools. Uh, to make this possible. So that was the genesis of DevRev. Uh, if you think about any company, and the reason I'm talking about this is when we talk about growth, uh, and we talk about PLG and sales, uh, because growth is actually cross-functional across your company. And that was the genesis of DevRev as well. So if you think about a company has uh, you know, four major functions, you're building software, you're operating the cloud, if you're a SaaS company, uh, you're supporting your customers, and then you're growing revenue. And typically, all these different functions, I mean, there en ends up being a divide as the company grows, right? So you tend to have product development teams, and then you have customer-facing teams. And over time, that divide just becomes larger and larger, uh, which makes it really hard for you to serve your customers and, and grow. So that's what we, you know, if you look at, there's either product and there's customer. And what we really call dev and rev. So dev is your development teams, and rev is revenue-facing or your customer-facing teams is a proxy of that. So, uh, you know, ultimately that that's the goal that we bring both dev and rev together. Uh, we do that with a, a knowledge graph of your company, and that knowledge graph is really key because then you enable every function. So I'll talk a little bit about this because, um, and the reason to talk about that is how do we enable growth for ourselves through PLG and sales? but also how do we do it for, for others? That was the idea. Um, so if you look at how the journey, or if you think about the odds of a startup, you know, every year you have you know, over 100,000 startups that get funded across the globe. You'll see less than 5,000 level reach a million in ARR, and uh, even fewer, less than 500 will ever reach 10 million in ARR. And then even further, if you think about it, there's less than 150 to date, I mean, across all these years that ever reached 100 million in ARR, and uh, even less than 25 companies that ever reached a billion dollars, right? So if you think about uh, you know, software space especially, 
and uh, Nutanix was one of those. So a lot of learnings from there, and if you think uh, about this journey, the odds are very slim. So there's every stage, you know, how do you get from zero to one? How do you get from one to 10? And, uh, and 10 to 100, they're all, uh, based on not just, you know, originally it is founder-led, there's a lot of um, founder-led sales and you can, you know, get growth that way, but a lot of what we'll talk about today is how do you set up your sales and marketing functions so that it can be set up for success, uh, that it can be set up to scale sustainably. So uh, it's clear, we, you know, to, to survive or if you have to beat the odds, uh, and if you do beat the odds, it typically takes, a, you know, anywhere between six to 10 years to get 100 million in ARR. And there's a spectrum of companies here. There are companies that did it earlier in six years. Uh, you have companies like Zoom, uh, and then you have companies like uh, Datadog that did it in eight years. Uh, and regardless of where you are in the spectrum, you know, how you get there also does matter because you could have a sales and marketing expense that is at 30% of revenue, which is quite efficient, uh, or you could be at 60, 70, or 80% of revenue. And you know, at Nutanix, you know, we were spending uh, you know, a billion dollars in sales and marketing to get a billion dollars in revenue, and that was not efficient at all. And uh, you know, as you know, that in this next decade especially, that, um, you know, that ratio has to be one is to three, right? So for every dollar that you spend, in sales and marketing, you know, you need to see, are you getting $3 in revenue, right? And that's, uh, you know, essential for uh, this next decade, interest rates are high. Uh, and, you know, if you think about your whole scalability of your growth, then that's a key factor. So really what we're talking about is not just growing fast, but also growing efficiently. So growing efficiently, uh, again, going back to the journey of a company, uh, when you have a phase one, you've built a product, and uh, you know, you're going to your, maybe the innovators of the world, maybe the early adopters, and you're getting some initial success. So this stage, the phase one of your company, it's also really important to select like who you go after, right? I mean, the market is really important, but who you go after, if, if you're building something that's innovative, you have to go find those innovators that are willing to try your product. But the initial success in phase one is, is, is probably small. You have like, you know, one to five customers that are validating your idea. And then after that, uh, it's really about repeatability, right? So can you repeat that initial success? Uh, and can you retain those customers becomes really important uh, in this phase two. And most people call this product market fit, right? It's product market fit because I was able to repeat that initial success. And once you do that, I, the next stage is really about you, uh, about you doing that in a very cost effective manner. So looking at even you know, customer acquisition costs and how that is going down over time is, is really important, right? So if you are set up uh, on a path for sustainable growth, then in this phase, you know, you need to start setting those foundations early on. But it's really about scalability there, figuring out how much it's costing you to acquire customers, also retain them and grow them. And that sets you up for success. So most companies uh, lack a strong foundation. You know, when you think about repeatability, like, uh, you know, how do I improve my funnel? Uh, you know, every week, right? So you're thinking about efficiencies across the funnel. So most companies lack a strong foundation and likely, you know, fail in this stage of phase two and, and beyond. And uh, what we'll talk about uh, today is, uh, is this hybrid model of PLG and SLG. I'd love to learn more about you, so if you could take a quick uh, quiz. Just a few questions. Turn it on. All right, sit down. Yes, all right. Well, the first question, what is PLG? They can't see the QR code. All right, PM-led growth. 
peace, love, and Godspeed come second. Uh, they're all they're all correct answers. There's no wrong answers here. Uh, it's just that the 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 PLG that we'll be talking about today is product-led growth. Uh, let's move to the next question. So, what does PLG mean to you? I mean, could be words, could be multiple words. Right, efficiency, yeah, awesome. Self-serve, like performance-led growth, that makes sense too. It needs, your funnel needs to be performing, nice. All right, all, all of them make, make a lot of sense. PLG means actually all of those things and, uh, and some more. We'll go to the next question. Right, so I'd love to learn how you guys are doing go-to-market, what motion you use. Is it PLG, is it SLG, is it a combination of both? very interesting because this says that folks are either sales led moving to PLG or their PLG uh, and SLG or moving from PLG uh, you know to SLG so it's clearly I mean the world has uh, is acknowledged I think you guys are acknowledging acknowledging that uh, it is a hybrid model, right? That's how, you know, we think about go-to-market uh, go as well. And today the stance I will take is actually about the hybrid model as well. So let's talk about what, what this hybrid model could look like. So uh, product-led, uh, you guys all had the right answer there. You're using product as the main vehicle to acquire customers to activate them and to retain them as well. And uh, sales-led is really layering in sales on top of this uh, you know, product-led motion. It could be when it's a hybrid model, uh, you, know, you layer it on, on top of the PLG motion. Uh, but essentially, you have product-led and sales-led. Uh, and today, what we'll talk about is, uh, is really this hybrid model and what could be the key differentiators in this hybrid model. So just setting the stage here in terms of the definitions, Product-led growth uh, and sales-led growth, the stance that you know, I'll be taking today is that they both have a place. Uh, there's a need for a hybrid model. Uh, and it is about uh, hyper-targeting. It is, it is about segmentation, ultimately. So it comes back to segmentation in that uh, who do you target for PLG, the lower end of the market, this, the users, uh, or, the, or do you target the buyers in the SLG? So product-led, uh, largely, you know, if you're swiping credit cards, you have uh, low-dollar, you know, smaller size deals. They could go through the PLG motion. Uh, you also have the user persona that you're catering to, where you're talking about the user and the user experience and how the user can get instant value from the product and continue to uh, extract that value. The way you acquire these uh, users also is important. I know someone over there mentioned like demand gen and how that happens. So demand gen uh, could be through the website, it's through your organic search or investment in SEO. Uh, it could also be through paid campaigns. Uh, it's also through your, uh, through the way you consume the product. There's free trial and freemium models and uh, there's a way to self-serve it. So essentially the user is highly optimized for a self-serve motion. They're using the product on their own. So I think most folks get like what is product-led growth and there's a sales-led growth motion as well where uh, we're talking about the larger deals. Uh, as you have a purchase order, you need to talk to a human and you know, that's where the entire sales-led motion comes in. So we'll talk today about uh, the three key pillars and how to differentiate when you have 
uh, this uh, PLG motion and uh, an SLG motion. The, the three key pillars are um, really we'll talk about product-led. The first one being how to be product-led, uh, but also have sales assist. So if you think about a user that is consuming the product, uh, then how can we assist that user through a sales assist model? Uh, and what I'll talk about is uh, really what is the core differentiation? Because most people, you know, understand uh, in 2023, I think most people understand like what is PLG. There's different, there's freemium tier, uh, there is self-serve, you have to optimize your pricing page. So there is a checklist that folks uh, do follow when it comes to PLG. And what we'll talk really about is what does it take to go from good to great, right? And to go from good to great, uh, there's a few other considerations uh, to have. And uh, these are, you know, free tier economics. Uh, do you have a veg product? Uh, are you using a mix of both digital nudges as well as human assist? So going back to the free tier economics, uh, so in order to support a PLG motion, because PLG motion is uh, acquiring large volume of users, and you're doing this on a daily basis, ideally, you're doing this uh, in large volume, people coming into the funnel, and uh, you need to be able to support them economically as well, because they may not pay in the next three months or six months, or maybe could continue to be in that free tier forever, especially if you have a freemium tier, right? So does the, uh, do the economics work is something that you should ask yourself uh, even in day, on day one. So thinking about like, at, you know, what we think about is, uh, you know, is it 50 cents per customer per month? Uh, is that a good goal to have? And it's not necessarily that it is a um, you know, finance decision. You know, finance is not the only party here when you talk about the cost to serve. So this is an overall company level collaboration when you're looking at engineering and product and there's tools and there's a lot uh, that happens in terms of cost to serve. So but staying or setting this foundation from day one is extremely crucial. So the engineering decisions you're making, the architectural decisions you're making all kind of impact that. So you may not be at that you know, at that number day one, but it is always important, you know, to continue to grow, continue to optimize that cost per customer, per tenant. Uh, so thinking about economics, uh, free tier economics, uh, a lot of companies that could start with SLG and want to move to PLG could have a hurdle in that, okay, what is my cost to serve these free customers? So something to think about day one uh, is really strong partnership with your engineering team, with your product teams to design uh, design a multi-tenant system that can serve not just thousands, maybe even millions of users someday, right? So that's the, the free tier. And if you think about the veg product, so we talked about how, you know, customers or users come to your website, they could sign up, uh, but how do they get instant value? And, uh, you know, Sneak, I don't know if you guys know Sneak as a company, and they did a great job with this. Uh, they built a sidecar product uh, to discover open source vulnerabilities in packages. So that was a great way to target the developer community before they could go and you know, talk to the buyer persona, et cetera. So it really worked as a, as a great sidecar product. And uh, similarly, the way we think about this is, is, is there an AI you know, co-pilot that anyone can come to our website, you know, enter their website URL, and we could build a co-pilot because we can scrape their website and build uh, a chat bot that is really smart about their company, that they could then just plug it into their website or their app. I mean, that's just an example, but the idea is that, uh, especially when you have more complex products, uh, a lot of times people go for a sales-led motion because of that as well, like, you know, how do I have those conversations? I need to be in person, I need to run a POC, but what if there's a veg product that can help you with that sales-led motion as well? And, uh, and that's when, you know, you can start small or give them a very easy way to experience the product and uh, then grow from there. Uh, the second or the last aspect here around product-led as well as a human assist becomes really important because uh, thinking about your signups that are coming into the app, uh, you have signups that are coming in that need to be nurtured, right? And uh, you could have your salespeople nurturing them, but you know, also think about the hybrid model where where you have uh, email nudges, where you have in, you know nudges inside your app that are really uh, progressing them across the funnel. So the idea is that you know once you have uh, you know a sign up or a user, 
uh, how do you actually have them do incrementally more and more? How do you have them experience this product? Uh, Notion did this really well. I don't know if you guys, when you do sign up on Notion, I think the first, uh, first week, you, ha you get an email every day, and then it has a really you know, nice CTA. Uh, it's a very actionable, and it incrementally gets you to a place where you could also invite your team. And now from an individual user trying the product, you've now invited you know, a team. It becomes a workplace product. So I think uh, to, to design this, to design the nudges, uh, is something that's, uh, that's something we obsess about, and we're still building and learning at DevRev. Uh, so if you think about like, you know, the LinkedIn nudges, there is in-app nudges, uh, there's phone calls, there's teams that will, uh, will talk to the user about how they're using and help them do demos and, and so on and so, uh, such. So even though product-led, I mean, is, is product-led, you know, I look at product-led as a combination of product-led and sales assist. And, uh, and similarly, when we have a sales-led motion, it is sales-led and product assist uh, because you know, these two really need to go hand in hand. So in a typical sales led motion as well, you have uh, you know, the checklist here, you have marketing qualified leads, you're trying to get a hand raised quickly on the website, get a demo, set up a meeting, you're doing customer advocacy. But let's talk about how you could go from good to great or what could really be the key differentiators in making sure your sales teams are also highly productive. How do you enable them, arm them, with the product and you know, enable them to be product experts. So the first, uh, you know, the first aspect of this is a product qualified lead, right? How do you do these handoffs? It's extremely uh, crucial because the, the PLG motion is actually setting the ground or is preparing the ground for sales. That's another way to think about it because yeah, over time, your PLG motion is going to generate significant revenue like Figma did, like Figma spent five years going from zero to one million, and then from there, from one to you know, 10 was another two years. But essentially, uh, PLG helps you prepare the ground, uh, but you could also have you know, people, your teams and large companies that are going through the PLG motion and that should be handed off uh, to sales. So we, we look at that as you know, someone who has signed up, someone who has high intent, or is integrated with us, you know, we look at who has been activated, and then from there, you know, we pass them on to sales. So this motion of uh, product qualified leads uh, is extremely uh, crucial. The other aspect is uh, left shifting the, the proof of concept. You know, sales uh, have three month cycles or three to six month cycles, sometimes with large enterprise, even, uh, you know, one year cycles or more. And if you have to left shift the, the proof of concept, uh, so what if, uh, you know, what if you could go into a meeting, the first meeting that you have uh, with an enterprise or even a mid-market or any of these sales meetings, but you've already, you know, mimicked their experience, you've already prepared the ground for them. So how do you do that? And if you understand their company, if you understand how they work, could you prepare, you know, um, prepare what we call this sandbox environment where they can actually go and feel like it is their company they can try. So, I mean, thinking about a POC cycle that could, uh, you know, last three months, it could be multiple meetings, could be multiple people, uh, you know, over, meeting over multiple times and talking about implementation. And sometimes you have to have vendors doing these POCs for you. Uh, but really, how can you left shift them such that even the first meeting can be so productive? And it can also mean that, um, uh, the sales uh, folks are going in really having a deep understanding of the company. They're also giving it a head start. Uh, the last aspect here around uh, SLG or really sales led is that it's, it's never really only you know, one mode. Uh, it typically takes, I want to say, uh, an average of 12 to 18 touches uh, before somebody really converts. So think about somebody the first time they see you and, and the number of touches it takes to uh, to convert them is uh, is a large number, so they don't. You know, there's this whole debate around attribution and how do you attribute? What, you know, how the customer converted, and it's clearly data clearly says that it's always you know multi-touch, multi-mode um, attribution. So when you think about conversions, it's not necessarily just the sales team that you're investing in, it's the communities that you're investing in, it's the digital ads that you play, it's the meetings you have, it's what you do inside the app. Because this is where PLG helps the, the sales-led motion as well. Because inside the app, you, you can say, okay, these users are doing X, I can nudge them 
to do more. So really uh, growing that user base through the product-led motion that's assisting the sales team is really important. So looking at multi-touch and a multi-mode or an average of 12 or even in some cases 18 to 26 touches it could take to, to convert a customer. <coughs> So the last uh, pillar is really about bringing it all together because you have uh, you know, the product-led motion, you have a sales-led motion, but how do you, uh, you know, think about growth? Uh, you know, growth has been defined in different ways. Uh, growth has been defined as a, or even been organized as a separate department in a lot of companies. It's been organized as you know, within a sales team or within a marketing team or a product team. Uh, and the way we look at growth at DevRev is that it has to be cross-functional uh, because product drives growth, um, because what the product is building and how it's nudging the users to do more, that drives growth. Sales drives growth with acquisition, customer success does, um, and marketing does drive growth as well. So which means that uh, when you talk about uh, how am I going to grow this quarter, all of these inputs are important because these are all leading indicators to driving growth. So the leading indicators means that you know, your team, your company needs to have uh, a view of, of your work, right? So work happens in different forms uh, towards growth. So when your product team is working or your developer is working, there's development issues they work on that are tied to customers, that's, that's a part of growth. Then you have uh, support teams and customer success teams that are working on support tickets that also drive growth. Uh, you have uh, the product management team, you know, look, looking at enhancements and roadmap, and that drives growth. Uh, and then you have, uh, you know, the sales teams looking at opportunities. But what if all of those came together? And uh, I think we try to do this. I used to try to do this in spreadsheets and, and different ways to bring it all together so work can be attributed back to the product, can be attributed back to the customer. Uh, and that's how you think about the entire growth engine. So really bringing it all together is, is really important. Uh, converging that business, converging your company towards growth actually means that you bring that work together, you bring every department together and see how they can contribute to growth. So we can talk, you know, we have, I know we only have 30 minutes uh, in this session, um, but we're hanging out here for, for more questions or comments, uh, but but and we can go deeper on any of those areas. Uh, but just to summarize, we have uh, you know we talked about uh, the hybrid model. I think the hybrid model is here to stay. That's my belief. Uh, we have the product-led motion, uh, product-led growth that has um, become a lot de facto. I think most people are considering it at least. You know when they begin the company, when they launch the company, and uh, you know I'd encourage that we think about the economics. You think about what is your veg product. You also think about nurturing those users, not just everything digitally, but also having some human or a salesless sales assist model. And the same thing with the sales team. How do you think about product helping or product being an assistant to sales? Uh, and then bringing all these departments together is really important. So with that, uh, we'll take a few questions. Minimum ticket size for the uh, customer journey to start, especially at the team level, uh, because you know beyond certain dollars, you know it, it, it needs approvals sure. and things Hello. like that. And in the current situation, there are budget cards and things like that. Uh, so companies, even Google, like you know, they need approval what is the minimum ticket size for, for PLG to start. PLG When you say ticket, you mean dollar size, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I think PLG can be free too, right? I mean, if you're talking about, I don't know if it's a minimum or a maximum. I would look at it more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. So there's a, a typically, you know, five thousand dollars as people are comfortable with uh, running a credit card. You know, some people maybe up to ten thousand dollars. But uh, but when you need a purchase order, when it becomes beyond a credit card, you're you know almost always having to you know, talk to people. Yeah. There was a question. There was a question back there. Can we have a question? No real question, but just want to say that very well laid out model and framework you've provided. This is really good. It's like the need of the hour. Thank you for sharing this uh, and uh, 
giving it to all of us. Thank you a lot. Thank you. <coughs> Sachin. <laughs> I guess just I wanted to maybe have you uh, comment on what kind of companies might be more led towards PLG versus SLG, um, maybe differences in product or differences in you know how people use the product. Yeah, yeah. So by the way, Sachin is with DevRev and he heads partnerships, ecosystems, startups a lot more, and he's based in Bangalore, so you should come uh, have a chat with him. So the the I guess the comment really being, you know, how do you choose between PLG and SLG typically? What type of products? What type of companies? Um, so I think in terms of products, typically, I know I hear people saying it's a complex product, so I can do PLG. Right. I mean, that's uh, that's typically the case. And the other thing I hear is that I'm in enterprise. I'm selling to enterprise. I can do PLG. Uh, so in both of these scenarios, I think let's think about uh, that hybrid model, because even in a complex product, you know, can you find a wedge? I think that's what I would encourage you guys to do. So can you find a wedge that makes it easy for someone to get a piece of the product to get initial, you know, initial value? Uh, and then, you know, from there you could expand. So thinking about like segmenting even your product portfolio beyond your go-to-market portfolio becomes important because every app, even if you have a complex uh, platform and a, and a product, can an app have a wedge product within it where, you know, there's an entry point and then I can grow from there. So that's, that's, that's what, you know, we think about it. And the other side is enterprise deals where, uh, you know, I think, sure, I think with uh, enterprise, you do need to have sales. That's the reality. But, um, but you can always start with small teams. So where PLG helps, and that's how Slack and Zoom had that traction, right? So what they did is they started with, you know, they opened it up, even Twilio, going back to the developer, you know, starting with one person, then that became a small team. And then they went to their manager and they went to their buyer. And that's how those became like, you know, from $5,000 deals to, you know, $100,000 deals and beyond. So even for a, you know, enterprise, it, it could be a small team in an enterprise that's an innovator. They want to do something different. Yeah. There was a question back there. Yeah. So I had a question. You mentioned about attribution and how a multi-attribution strategy works better. How do you see like having those 12 touch points or something of that? Do you be strategic in terms of what could be driven by the wedge, which you mentioned comes from PLG, and what could be maybe event-led, sales-led, something of that. So how do you distribute your touch yeah. points, and can you be strategic about it? Yeah, yeah. So so I think the, the touch points can actually help both PLG and SLG. Because even if it is a, even if it is a community user or a free user, uh, they could have heard about your product maybe 12 times, like once on Reddit, once on your you know, social media, once because you had a newsletter. So there could be so many modes. So the way I, I don't think of it as like one leading the other, but I, I look at it as multi-touch, just, ha you know, it, it's, the, it's, it's the table stakes right now, right? It's table stakes to touch your user, to touch your customer in multiple modes, because that's how they, they grow on you. I mean, they understand your brand, they get credibility, you build trust. Now, uh, between PLG and SLG, of course, there could be different modes that you have to touch, right? So with SLG and enterprise deals, you have to have meetings, you have to be in events, you have to be in big conferences, where do these people hang out? So thinking about your customer segment, where do they hang out? And, and how can I touch them both digitally and digitally also? There are so many uh, mediums within that, identifying those strong communities that resonate with your value proposition. And then also, how do you do that physically, small events or large events? You know, there could be different types of meetups as well, right? So both are important. There's a question right here. Hi. Uh, in a pr uh, PLG model, like uh, how much of a collaboration is required between a product team and a marketing team? Like how, how they can better collaborate and who drives it? For example, you mentioned Wedge uh, as a product, right? Uh, so who identifies it? Uh, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, me and Michael have to be best friends. Let's just say that. So Michael has product and, and marketing. Uh, I, you know, we have to be best friends. Uh, I think in more recently that line is also blurring, right? So between PM and PMM and whether you talk about what does a PM do, I think PM also has to be go-to-market focused. 
you need the pmms to also be you know product focused so really uh, bleeding into each other space is really important uh, what we do uh, try i mean especially to to bring this closer is of course we we have uh, you know growth weeklies where we are coming together and looking at the end to end experience so it's not clearly like one person driving because think about it the first product is your website on the plg motion so the experience really, uh, needs to start from the website and uh, it starts from educating the user they need to understand the value before they click sign up and once they click sign up and they're in the product there's onboarding and that journey has to be optimized so we look at it as a as a pod like you know core set of leads that meet regularly uh, initially like these are i don't know 4 hour 5 hour meetings where we're obsessing over every click and we're optimizing different parts of the website the product uh, everything outside of the website and product as well uh, again going back to Uh, what i was saying is that growth is product and marketing and sales and customer success so that that's how we think about it yeah there's a question so, sales assist yeah, yeah. Yes, absolutely. No, I, I think you you actually articulated it quite well. I think it's it's both because uh, when somebody comes from product led, the sales assist can't be pushy, right? I mean, there's a different type of personality, different skill set for this team versus a team that is doing outbound calls on cold, you know, cold outbound calls. So, you know, in our company, we we have two different teams. I mean that. closely collaborate they learn what they've uh, heard from customers but the incentives are different uh, the team is different the skill set is also slightly different because as you look at inbound and people coming through product led you want this person to be you know more smarter on the product you want them to be able to not be pushy they're like hey i'm here uh, to help you if you need me right and uh, people you know a lot of people will not even respond and that's that's okay but when when they do we're here to help and be a little little more smarter than on the product than maybe uh other teams right or it could be that uh, they're able to do a demo they're able to uh do an integration you know doing an integration is is a, is a big you know is a uh, slightly complex problem and the other aspect of sales led is bringing people in through a product led motion is also quickly handing it off to the sales folks right so the way we segment it is based on the customer persona so if it is a customer persona it's a large company uh, you could define it anyway um, we define it as even more than 50 employees say so anybody more than 50 employees you want to route it to an account executive as quickly as possible and that 50 could become 100 you know 6 months from now and and so on um, i think it, it's it's the handoffs that are important the skill sets are slightly different and uh, as you plan it i think it's just you know it's a lot of process that's all i say i think if you know i realize that you know marketing and growth is a lot like engineering everything has to come together everything has to be handed off there has to be quality there has to be checks and it, there's a lot of uh, yeah 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 so what we uh, measure so think about consumption so th- what you just mentioned is uh, is the opportunity so what are those that are going back to sales the other dimension to think about is consumption because what this team is doing is driving them to consume more so for as an example for a user that has signed up this week did the sales assist a team uh, bring them back to the app right i mean that's our goal at the very the first goal is that after the first day did they come back to the app did they invite another user we call this exploring but think about it like you're actually coming back because i found something valuable or i heard from this person who gave a call 
and uh, you know talk to me about it so there's different goals but the, we we think about consumption at a broad level and that consumption could be different for your product uh, but did they come back is one way and also again going back to attribution because we have to know what worked uh, so we look at uh, you know did they come back because of an email that we sent so going back to the utms that are embedded through the utms are we uh, we know that okay that email and that message worked was it the LinkedIn campaign that worked? Was it the calling that worked? Or was it a digital ad? So a lot of different reasons. But, uh, but given it is multi-touch, you can never attribute to one. But it helps you get better with that channel. It helps you get better with the messaging. I, th I think, OK. This one. Ah. Uh, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't cracked that yet, um, but uh, that is a very good point uh, because they may never want to, you know, talk to you, and that's fine. That's why the product has to do a lot more. So, bringing back to onboarding, like onboarding, can it be self-serve? Documentation. I mean, I think it's underestimated how important, you know, documentation is for developers. They li just like to go and read and just get stuff done. So that's where I think it becomes even more challenging with with product-led growth and engineering teams. You. Just got to crack the self-serve. All right. Well, thank you so much for your questions. We'll be hanging out here. Uh, please come to our booth. We also have, <laughs> if you want to enter the raffle, um, Kavya and Aditi have some cool gifts. Uh, we'll take a few quiz. We can leave it on, yeah. Awesome. And we'll be also be hanging out here if you have more questions or want to have a chat. Thank you.